We are live. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online, the three sixty eighth episode, forty third in the Ocular Plastic module. Today we have with us the very dynamic Professor Maya Hada from SMS Medical College, Jaipur, to speak to us on orbital infections, the parasitic part. Professor Hada uh, did her MBBS from Savai Man Singh Medical College, Jaipur and has the honors of having a gold medal for the first position in MBBS. She finished her post-graduation from the prestigious RP Center Ames with again a gold medal for the first position. She did a senior residency in ocular plastics in RP Center Ames. Formerly, she was the consultant and in charge of ocular plastics at Medanta in Delhi NCR. And currently, she is the associate professor and in charge of ocular plastics and ocular oncology services at SMS Jaipur. She is a recipient of several awards. To name a few, is the best video award at the BOPSS, that is the British Ocular Plastic Surgery Society conference at Oxford, the best scientific video at OPAI 2019, the ROS 2022, WOS 22, and the OPAI 2023 and the OPL. She was speaker at many national and international conferences and has many publications and book chapters to her credit. And she also happens to be the section editor and assistant editor of prestigious journals in ophthalmology. Over to you, ma'am, for today's lecture. Thank you uh, so much, Shubha, for that kind introduction. So first of all, I am thankful to iFocus Online and Dr. Honawar, sir, for having me here at this prestigious platform where the residents are learning through such an exemplary lectures. So I am going to discuss today uh, the very interesting uh, part that is the orbital parasitic infections. Can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So uh, orbital parasitic infections, I'll be talking mainly about the orbital cysty circus and the hydrated cyst. And also I'll touch upon the ectoparasite that is orbital myasis. So I'll start with the cystic circus cyst and uh, getting back into the history, it is surprising to know that cystic circus cyst was discovered way back in 1829 by Sommerings, who discovered the live cyst in the anterior chamber in the human eye. And then Von Graffe in 1866 reported so many uh, ophthalmic locations of the cystic circus. He reviewed around 90 cases and most of them he found uh, intraocular cystic circus. Uh, so what is cystisarcosis? It's basically a parasitic infection by the cystisarcus cellulosi. And that is a larval form of the tinea solium that we call popularly as tapeworm. So uh, how does this tapeworm infect the human beings? There are basically two different terminologies that you must understand. Teniasis and cystisarcosis. So teniasis is the uh, infection by this adult tinea solium that lives in the intestine of the human being. And the human acquired this infection by eating some uncooked or, uh, you know, contaminated pork, uh, harvesting the larva cystic circus. So the cystic, uh, the stenia solium basically has this head. And on the head, there are uh, these, uh, the head is also called as a scolex. And it has the hooks as well as the suckers. Then there is a neck part and then the whole body is uh, consisting of proglotids, immature, mature and the gravid ones. So these are the gravid proglotids which have the eggs, embryonated eggs, which are expelled in the uh, stool. Okay, so once this gra uh, gravid proglotids are uh, expelled out in feces and these are ingested by the pig and he develops this uh, cystic circus inside the muscles and then through this uh, uncooked or contaminated pork, the human again uh, take this cetinia inside the body. So this is complete life cycle of the uh, tinea solium. But how does the human acquire cystic circosis? So accidentally, if the human ingest these eggs via some contaminated food, water, or you know salad, which are contaminated by the eggs, and then this eggs will go into the human body and inside the gastric cavity uh, the chitinous shell is dissolved and then this embryo will come out and penetrate the gastric mucosa and will enter into the portal circulation and via that it will go into the various body parts namely cns eyes striated muscles or subcutaneous parts so most commonly we see the uh, cns or brain is the most common location of the cystic circosis. Other than that, as I told you, 
it can be in the subcutaneous it can it can be seen as subcutaneous nodules or it can be in the striated muscles so what is the reason for these few tissues uh, for having cystic circles it is the high glucose or glycogen content in these tissues so there is a tropism for cystic circle and how does it uh, go into the orbit or eye because you know the uh, the ophthalmic artery is the first and the single collateral branch of the ICA so via this ophthalmic artery it will go into the short posterior ciliary artery and then into the choroidal circulation and thereby entering into the subretinal space and the vitreous cavity other than that through the muscular arteries it will go into the extraocular muscles so the ocular or orbital cystic circles comprise of around 13 to 46% of the systemic disease all right so the intraocular cystic circles is reported very commonly in western literature it is said to be most common uh, you know location in the uh, adnexal or eye cystic circles whereas in the indian literature it is the extraocular muscles the myocystic circles is which is labeled as most common all right so as i told you it enters through the choroidal circulation and then it will come into the subretinal space and vitreous cavity and it's very easy to diagnose you can just see via the indirect ophthalmoscopy that was also one reason before we have these imaging techniques developed so much so that it was diagnosed more frequently than the orbital cystic circles now the orbital cystic circles that we are going to talk now uh, have many locations most commonly extraocular muscles and that too superior rectus is the one which is most common then apart from extraocular muscles is the subconjunctival uh, cystic circles that is very commonly seen and some rare locations for the orbital cystic circles is the optic nerve lacrimal gland and the eyelid so we'll discuss them one by one now the uh, myocystic circles that is the cystic circles lodged in the extraocular muscle is a, a typical masquerade okay so it can have a very different kind of presentations so uh, uh, how uh, it can have different presentations because you know first of all the muscle is inflamed so it can present as a myositis or a pseudo tumor kind of picture so patient can have a uh, you know limitation of extraocular movements along with that there can be some periorbital swelling edema and then apart from that there can be a uh, cellulitis like picture so uh, we have to have a very high index of suspicion in such cases if patient is having some inflammatory orbital signs and along with that there is movement limitation then think about uh, myocystic circles and get an imaging done imaging is diagnostic for myocystic circles and what you will see on imaging this is called as a dot in the hole sign okay you will see a cyst and in the center of the cyst you will see a dot that is the hyperdense structure because of the scolex and this muscle will be thickened because of the uh, myositis all right so this patient uh, presented to me this this was a 13 year old male and you can see there is a swelling in the upper eyelid the eyelid is uh, having this edema and he was also having some pain and uh, there there is a mechanical ptosis that you can see i was little bit congested and he was uh, you know he was diagnosed as preseptal cellulitis and he was treated with oral antibiotics but that was not leading to resolution of this swelling so uh, on imaging uh, i saw that the sr muscle is thickened and also there is a cystic lesion inside the muscle you can see there is a hypointense lesion and in the center of that cyst there is a hyperintense the uh, lesion so that is characteristic of the scolex inside the cystic circle cyst and here on the axial section you can very well appreciate the scolex the invaginated head of the larva which is attached to the cyst wall all right so it's beautifully seen here so patient was started on oral albendazole and steroid here you can see that the edema is resolved and there is some improvement in ptosis after 2 weeks and then at the end of four weeks the ptosis is also near totally resolved so uh, there are few reports where myocystis circosis has presented as orbital cellulitis like in this lady so always you know have a, a high index of suspicion and how will you differentiate it from orbital cellulitis you know the proptosis is not that much that you will see in orbital cellulitis chemosis is also, also not that much then movement limitation is in what particular gaze not unlike in orbital cellulitis and then of course the imaging is diagnostic can there be a vision loss in myocystis circosis 
So in this case, there was a very posterior cyst in the lateral rectus muscle and there was the spillover inflammation of the adjacent optic nerve. So uh, it leads to sometimes an atypical optic neuritis kind of picture. So the patient presented with decreased vision in that eye and uh, she was having a vision of 6 by 60 and that resolved, of course, with the medical management. So sometimes it can lead to uh, uh, you know, spillover inflammation to the adjacent optic nerve and that can also lead to decreased vision. Optic nerve itself can have a cysticircus cyst because it's also a vascular structure. It has a supply from the ophthalmic artery. So a uh, few cases have been reported where the cyst was present inside the substance of the optic nerve. Like in this case, on ultrasound, you can very well see the scolex inside the optic nerve. And then the patient was having a disc edema, a uh, relative afferent pupillary defect, of course, decreased vision. So patient has a picture of this atypical optic neuritis in such cases. And sometimes you can uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, differentiate it from the optic nerve glioma. So optic nerve glioma with cystic degeneration may also mimic this picture. But yes, if the scolex is there, then it is definitely a cystic circus. In absence of scolex, it can mimic a optic nerve glioma also. Subconjunctival cystic circus. So you will see a very well formed nodular uh, cyst in, uh, you know, mostly in the fornices or near the caruncle or at the uh, late near the lateral canthus. Okay, why uh, at this location? Because they are mostly present at the insertion site of the extraocular muscles. Okay, so basically. Uh, to my understanding and what uh, is given in the literature, it's a type of, it's a secondary stage of myocystry circus. So basically it's a myocystry circus cyst which anteriorly migrate or present at the insertion site which appears as a subconjunctival cystic circus. So this is a B scan ultrasound of the subconjunctival cyst and here also you can see the scolex inside the cyst. So this young boy, six-year-old male presented with this, you can appreciate the lower eyelid swelling and some congestion and he was having little pain and the redness. So on retraction of the lower eyelid, what you can see is this yellowish nodular uh, mass over the insertion of the uh, inferior rectus muscle and the uh, adjacent congestion that is because of the inflammation and what you will suspect now it is a very clear-cut uh, picture of a subconjunctival history circus and to confirm the diagnosis you can go for any imaging or ultrasound technique where it will be seen as a hypodense uh, structure and within that hypodensity you will see the hyperdensity because of the scolex okay that dot in whole sign so the patient was again given a oral albendazole and steroid treatment. I'll discuss about the treatment part later on in detail. And at the four weeks follow up, you can see first the inflammation resolved a little bit. Then the cyst also collapsed a little bit after four weeks. Now the eyelid cystic circus is basically a subcutaneous cystic circus, which can be in any part of the body. Similarly, it's there in the eyelid. So only uh, two or three cases are reported and it can mimic anything like a lesion or dermoid epidermoid cyst. And the only uh, uh, way to uh, you know, know the diagnosis is histopathology. So like any other eyelid cyst, you can just go and excise it and, uh, and just diagnose it on histopathology. Lacrimal gland cystic circus, two cases are reported and it can either present as a dacryops like in one case and in the other case it presented as dacryoadenitis. So uh, you must understand the stages of cystic circuses so that you can know the natural you know, course of the disease and how to manage it. So first is the live stage, that is the vesicular stage. Second is the, when the cyst starts dying, it becomes colloidal vesicle. And then it's the dead cyst, that is a granular or calcified nodule. So in the live cyst, the vesicular stage, you will see a very well-defined cyst with the clear contents. Okay, the contents are very clear. And in the center, you will see the scolex. So that is a characteristic feature of a live cyst. And then there is no adjacent inflammation. If it is present in a muscle or it is present in the subconjunctival space, uh, there won't be any congestion or uh, adjacent inflammation in the first stage. And then how do you confirm that it is live? In the intraocular cyst, you will see the movements uh, of that undulating kind of movement. And then particularly when you stimulate it by the light, then you will uh, see the evagination of the scolex also. 
then second stage is when the cyst starts dying so what happens to the cyst contents they will become more turbid because of this increased protein content and after that the cyst wall becomes leaky and it will start releasing toxins into into the adjacent tissues and the muscle will be inflamed so there will be signs of myositis there will be pain there will be movement limitation everything and then once the larva dies then there is a collapse of the cyst okay so this you can very well appreciate on serial ultrasonographic follow up okay so initially you will see a large cyst with scolex and then later on the scolex disappears and the cyst will collapse and in the last stage that is a dead cyst it forms a granule and later on it becomes calcified so not all the cyst becomes calcified okay it's more common uh, in neurocystic sarcosis in the orbital uh, cystic sarcosis it can just become a granular nodule and, or it can just collapse or get resorbed okay so the clinical features are uh, you know there are represented by which uh, which stage of the cyst is there okay so if the cyst is a live cyst then only mass effect will be there okay and if the cyst is dying then there will be added inflammatory signs also okay so mostly it is seen in children and young adults and the presenting signs and in the order of their presentation more mainly it's a periocular swelling or pain ptosis diplopia movement restriction proptosis can be there if the myositis is significant and the muscle is very much thickened then decreased vision if there is a spillover optic nerve inflammation spontaneous extrusion can occur sometimes so treatment so you don't have to have a tissue diagnosis for starting the treatment it's basically a radiological or clinical diagnosis and medical management is the mainstay of treatment okay so surgery is done in very few limited indications so what is the drug of choice it's albendazole and it's given in 15 mg per kg per day in two divided doses for four weeks that is the standard treatment protocol and because you know that uh, it will lead to inflammation when the cyst will start dying so you uh you add some anti inflammatory that is steroids along with that and this dose of the steroid is 1 mg per kg per day for 4 weeks and thereafter you taper it for another 4 weeks so you are giving albendazole for just one month and you are giving steroids for another 4 uh, weeks so you can see the response to the treatment on serial ultrasound as i told you so here you can see a very well defined cyst with a central scolex then after 2 weeks of starting the anti helminthic or cysticidal treatment you can see the scolex has disappeared but the muscle thickness remains unchanged and after that you can see the cyst has started collapsing and muscle thickness is reduced and after 6 uh, to 8 weeks you can see the muscle thickness has come back to normal and cyst is totally resolved so this is how you see the progression uh, the response to the treatment okay so uh for initial 1 to 2 weeks and 3 to 4 weeks you give albendazole and still after the uh, completion of 4 weeks you continue giving steroids okay now the steroids are very important there was this case report from rp center where the patient skipped using steroids and just took albendazole and the inflammation increased after 2 weeks of albendazole and she presented with this kind of picture and when again the steroids were started she recovered back so it's very important to explain the patient about taking steroids sometimes the scolex may not be visible so what will you do in those cases so if there is a cyst inside the muscle without a scolex what you will do so it can be as i told you as per the natural history of disease there can be a dying cyst where the scolex has disappeared or a patient has taken taken some treatment and it's like partially regressed or it can be myositis so myositis will have a diffuse kind of picture and cyst is not there usually so if the cyst is there along with myositis then assume it to be a myositis sarcosis whether or not the scolex is there and treat it as myositis sarcosis this was a study by dr pushkar and et al and uh, they have advocated this line of management that uh, you have to go for imaging in all cases and then if it's a subconjunctival eyelid uh, cysty circus go for excision if it is a myocystic circus then look for scolex so cystic lesion with scolex give albendazole steroid cystic lesion without scolex and then they have done elisa test so elisa if it is positive 
then go for the albendazole steroid. If it is negative, then just give steroid. So, uh, but now the consensus is that if even if the ELISA is negative and you have a cystic lesion uh, without scolex, then you should treat it as myocystic sarcosis only. Now, uh, for all the residents, it's very important to do fundus examination because you have to rule out any intraocular cyst before starting the cystricidal therapy because the cystricidal therapy will lead to uh, leakage of proteins and you know death of the cyst inside the eye and that can lead to a, a severe endophthalmitis like picture. Okay, so always rule out that intraocular cyst. And it is said that it's always good to have an imaging of the brain also to look for any associated neurocystic sarcosis, but it is not very common to have combined orbital and neurocystic sarcosis together. There are a few reports where miliary neurocystic sarcosis have uh, multiple cysts in the orbit and the muscle and patient had presented with bilateral visual loss that can be attributed to either raised ICT uh, leading to secondary optic atrophy or because of some chiasmal compression or multiple cysts infecting the occipital lobe that was not clear. So what is the role of surgical excision? So definitely in intraocular subconjunctival and eyelid cyst, surgical excision is recommended. Sometimes if there is a residual cyst following medical management, uh, then also you can go ahead with the excision. So this patient, she uh, presented with the lateral rectus myocystic sarcosis and you can see the very well-defined uh, cystic lesion here. She was given the medical management, which is the menstrual of management, but however, the cyst persisted. And uh, here, because the cyst was very anteriorly located and accessible, so we went ahead and excised the cyst. You have to take care not to use any sharp dissection on the cyst wall and just prolapse it by just excising the adjacent uh, sheath. And this video is basically to show you how the cyst looks like. So this is very thin wall and you can see the scolex inside beautifully. And you have to send the sample for histopathology to confirm the diagnosis. And that is confirmed by seeing the calcareous corpuscles. So the scolex is surrounded by the calcium layers, which are called as calcareous corpuscles and this is very diagnostic of the cestort tissue. So learning points from the cystic sarcosis is that it can masquerade as inflammatory lesions of the orbit. You have to have high index of suspicion. You must know the sonographic and CTP uh, characteristic features and medical management is the uh, standard of care. Now coming to the orbital hydrated cyst, this is caused by the dog tap form. That is the echinococcus granulosus. Very common in Middle East, Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia, including India. Now, the, uh, uh, like the tinea solium, the adult lives in the uh, intestine of the human. Likewise, the dog type worm also lives in the intestine of dogs. And the, uh, the dog releases these eggs in the stools, which are ingested by the sheep through the grass, which is contaminated by the stools. And then the sheep will develop hydrated cyst inside the various body tissues and the dead organs, the vistas of the sheep is then eaten by the dog and the cycle goes on. And the man become accidental intermediate host. How? If the embryonated egg in the dog stools are, uh, you know, if these eggs contaminate any kind of food which is ingested by human and then again, these embryonated eggs will go into the, uh, you know, the stomach and duodenal, and then the gastric juices will dissolve the chitinous shell, the embryo will be lib liberated, and most of the embryo they get destroyed by the gastric juices, but some are, uh, you know, spared and they penetrate the gastric mucosa and they go into the portal circulation and then they disseminate throughout the body. And then most commonly they live into the hepatic uh, system only. And they also go to the lungs and to the CNS and the orbit is very rarely, uh, you know, affected. So these are the various body parts where the hydrated cyst can be found. You know, it's in the brain, in the, in the lungs, in the liver, kidneys and orbit is affected in 0.3 to 1% in uh, the systemic hydrated disease. All right. So if you look at the hydrated cyst per se, when this larva reaches the tissue, it will form the three layers. The outermost layer, which is because of the condensation of the host tissue around the cyst. Okay, it's not actually a part of hydrated, it's just a connective tissue of the host. Then 
then the second layer is the laminated membrane that is actual uh, ectocyst of the cyst and the innermost is the germinal layer and the germinal layer is the active layer which you know forms the brood capsules which contains the scolysis and then they get separated and forms the daughter cyst okay so it's the aging process of a hydrated cyst if it's a young hydrated cyst it will be just a mother cyst and if it if it's a older hydrated cyst it, the, it will contain multiple daughter cysts inside okay and it grows uh, every year by 1.5 cm inside the orbit okay so sometimes the patient may not be knowing and they expand uh, so much that it causes huge proptosis okay now the usg characteristics are very uh, important to know to diagnose the hydrated cyst because you know that there are uh, three distinct layers this double wall sign was given by dr betharia and it says that you can see the double wall on the ultrasonography you can see the inner germinal layer which is separated by laminated layer and the outermost layer and this is there is a clear zone between the two hyperechoic zone which is clearly seen on sonography other than that you can see the hydrated sand what is hydrated sand i told you there are brood capsule and scolysis inside the cyst so the cyst is very clear okay this fluid content is very clear and inside that clear cyst you will see echogenic dots echogenic structures and these are attached to the cyst wall so these are the scolysis which can be seen as a hydrated sand also on ct and mri you can see attached to the cyst wall there is some condensation there is an area of condensation that is a collection of scolysis now uh, the uh, echinococcus that affects the human beings causing hydrated cyst is mostly echinococcus granulosus as i told you and it causes the cystic echinococcus which usually expand and causes pressure atrophy whereas there is another variant called as echinococcus multilocularis and it causes alveolar echinococcus so this alveolar is uh, you know having a infiltrative kind of growth pattern and in, it can even metastasize there are reports and there are uh, oligarthras and bogeli echinococcus which causes polycystic echinococcus the one case has been reported by dr honavar in which multiple cysts were there so typically it is a unilocular cyst which is caused by echinococcus granulosus so coming to the various cases this was a very huge proptosis in this young lady and uh, you can see that the globe is displaced downwards she has lost his vision her vision and uh, on ct scan you can see there is a huge uh, cyst and the contents are almost similar to that of the vitreous okay so the absorptive value of the cyst content is similar to the vitreous or csf and there is no enhancement with contrast okay and you can see it has expanded the orbital cavity because it's a slowly expanding cyst so it causes a mass effect and causes expansion of the orbit sometimes the proptosis may be subtle like in this case there is an actual proptosis with the uh, you know superior displacement of the eyeball a little bit and on imaging you can see a very well defined intraconal cyst and this is displacing the optic nerve superior laterally okay so it's uh, mainly in the inferior medial part of the intraconal space so you can uh, have a differential of dermoid here okay so when the cyst is not that large then you can uh, have a differential of dermoid but you can uh, very well you know differentiate it on ct or ultrasound with a characteristic feature okay there is a fat density uh, uh, in the dermoid and it's mainly in association with you know subperiosteum or uh, bone then mucosal can also sometimes uh, you know have this kind of presentation but it will have a connection with the sinuses and the contents are not that clear because it has a mucus inside then hemorrhage like hematinic cyst for example a hemorrhage into the lymphangioma or a hematinic cyst post trauma that can also have a uh, you know cystic presentation but they all have a typical radiological appearance like you know in the lymphangioma you have some kind of you know solid and cystic components and uh, uh you can have you know flab bullets on ct scan so and then the double wall is typical so in this case also we went ahead with this ultrasound and you you can see this double wall and some scolysis attached to the cyst wall so this diagnosis was confirmed now why it is important to diagnose early one thing is that because of the expansion it can compress the nerve it can threaten the vision and other thing is there can be spontaneous rupture 
and the spontaneous rupture is very a dreaded uh, you know it can have an anaphylactic shock which is reported in pulmonary or splenic hydrated cyst rupture but not reported in the orbit uh, what is reported in the orbit is severe inflammation post spontaneous rupture of the hydrated cyst. So anaphylaxis has not had happened yet in orbital hydrates, but yes, severe orbital cellulitis like picture can happen, and when the once the or hydrated cyst ruptures. So management is surgical uh, removal without rupture. You have to take care that the cyst contents doesn't spill over. So either you do a conventional end block removal or you go for a cyst decompression followed by extraction. So end block removal is very difficult. As you see, the cyst is so large and through the small tight orbit, you cannot remove it end block without rupture. All right. And once you rupture it, there will be spillage of the scolysis in the orbit. And, uh, you know, there will be lo local recurrence and even dissemination causing systemic hydrated disease. So what is recommended is aspiration of the cyst fluid that will lead to collapse of the inner cyst and then you dissect the fibrous layer that is the host connective tissue and then you assist uh, cryo uh, assisted extraction of the inner cyst can be done in the end. So this is a short surgical video in, of the same patient that I showed you where the intraconal uh, hydrated cyst was there. So I'm going through the transconjunctival approach. So after dissecting the conjunctiva and tenons, with the blunt dissection, you separate the uh, orbital fat going into the retrobulbar part. So here, this is the cyst, the outermost wall you can see here, this whitish thing. So this is the condensation of the host tissue around the cyst. Okay, so this is called as pericyst. So now to decompress the cyst, you, uh, you, know, you just uh, put your needle and aspirate the cyst contents. And uh, I did it twice. Actually, I found that still the cyst is not decompressed well. So in two goes, the cyst was decompressed. And now I dissected the outer fibrous layer. So what I'm holding now is the outer fibrous layer. And on dissection, I opened up this outer fibrous layer to look for the inner uh, ectocyst. You can see that white thing that is the laminated membrane. Okay, so this is the ectosis the laminated membrane which is prolapsed now now it is very fragile it is if you touch with the toothed forceps it will cut open okay so just put a cryoprobe and very through very gentle movement and traction you just lift it up and remove it in total okay so now there is no risk of spillage of the contents you have removed the whole cyst in total all right and because it's not attached with any blood supply there's no bleeding at all now in opening the uh, cyst, you can see the fluid inside, the scolysis inside. All right. So, and then the wound is closed by continuous 80 vicro sutures. And this is the patient on day one post op. You can see the proptosis is resolved. So, uh, is there any role of any adjuvant or preoperative cysticidal medication? So, in the non-orbital uh, hydrated cyst, it is given to reduce the size of the cyst. Oral albendazole is given. But uh, in the orbital uh, hydrated, we just give adjunct uh, oral albendazole because you, as you are aspirating the cyst. There may be some spillage uh, that may occur. So, on the safe side, you can give an adjunct treatment. So, this is the third uh, case of the uh, hydrated. This was a 24-year-old male. And he was having this abaxial proptosis with lateral globe displacement. And uh, the, there was some disc edema with movement limitation. And on imaging, you can see there are multiple cysts in the uh, superior medial compartment. Okay, So there were around three to four cysts which were going up to the apex and also displacing the optic now laterally. Okay. So again, because the surgical excision is treatment of choice, we went ahead with the anterior orbitotomy under GA. This is the uh, subro incision. And uh, after, uh, you know, dissecting the orbicularis, then the periosteum was reflected. This is a superior oblique tendon, which I'm reflecting. And, you know, that superior medial orbit is very, you know, tight uh, zone where so many neurovascular bundle is there. And this is such a large cyst again. So you cannot remove it and block. So again, you have to aspirate it. So this is the 26 gauge needle over 10 ml syringe. So I'm aspirating the cyst contents. You can see the cyst getting collapsed. And, uh, you know, we have to monitor the vitals and all because there is always a theoretical risk of getting anaphylaxis during uh, cyst aspiration also. So this fibrous 
tissue, which is the condensed outer wall. I am dissecting it out. And then you can see multiple daughter cysts which are lying. So this was very aged hydrated cyst. And there were around three to five daughter cysts which were lying. So I'm removing them one by one through the cryo extraction. So second cyst is removed. This is the third cyst. I was not expecting so many because in the CT scan, they were kind of compressed and there were only three cysts which were visible on CT scan. This was the fourth one and very tiny fifth one. So five cysts were uh, removed in total. Then the closure was done. And here again, on opening these cysts, you can see the scolysis and these can be confirmed on histopathology. So this is the patient doing well in post-operative period. All right. So as I told you, the polycystic echinococcus has also been reported by Dr. Hunawar, and uh, they have removed around 20 to 30 cysts, uh, as they have reported. And this was caused by echinococcus oligarthrus. And disseminated hydrated disease is not very common. Only one case report uh, I came across that uh, was when the cyst in the orbit was associated with cyst in the liver, lung, and the spleen. Other than that, the orbital cysts are usually invariably isolated. There is no not much role of serology because it's an encysted uh, parasite. So the antibodies are usually negative. Now, PAIR is a very popular technique uh, for the hepatic, uh, this uh, hydrated cyst, which has been tried in orbital cyst also. And here, what you do, PAIR stand for percutaneous aspiration and then irrigation with the uh, scolicidal agent and then re-aspiration. So, uh, Akhen et al., they have reported that they aspirated this uh, hydrated cyst percutaneously, 7 ml of the fluid was aspirated. Then they irrigated it with uh, 3 ml of hypertonic saline solution, leave it for 10 minutes, and then they re-aspirated it. And the cyst collapsed over a period of few months, and there was no recurrence. So I also tried it in one of my patients. She was very reluctant for surgery, and the cyst was very uh, you know, uh, accessible. It was lying in the inferior orbit. It was palpable. So uh, I aspirated it and then uh, irrigated it with hypertonic saline. And this was eight weeks follow. There was some residual cyst uh, there, but on uh, like uh, three months follow up, it was like, uh, you know, reducing up to like 10% of it was there, but there was no recurrence there. So learning points are, if you see a large orbital cystic lesion, which is having a chronic or subacute presentation, think about hydrated. You have to know the ultrasound and imaging features which are characteristic for your diagnosis. Timely surgical intervention is needed. Okay, and the uh, aspiration followed by removal with cryo is the standard and effective technique. Lastly, I'll just touch upon quickly upon the orbital myasis. It's an ectoparasite, which is the infection uh, by the larval stage of the fly. Okay, and uh, the orbital myasis accounts for only five, less than 5% of the cases of human myasis. And it's most commonly by the bot fly larva called as estrus ovis. Okay, now there are three categories of ophthalmomyasis. One is ophthalmomyasis externa, in which the larva attack the conjunctiva. Then there is ophthalmomyasis interna. When the larva go inside the eye, it causes uveitis. It goes into the subretinal space also. And there is orbital myasis. Orbital myasis is seen in when the larva goes into the orbit. And those are the cases which are neglected fungating orbital masses, okay? When the patient is having, say, a fungating uh, squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma, which is ulcerating and not being taken care by surgery or chemo or etc., then there can be, uh, there is a predisposition that the fly can, uh, you know, lay the eggs over there and it will, uh, it will grow into the larvae, which will burrow deep into the orbit and destroy all the orbital tissues as well as the eye. So uh, traumatic wounds around the eye can also get contaminated and can get uh, in, infected with the flies. Okay, So this was a case, 70-year-old male. He was having this mass over the uh, right eye and complaining of pain, crawling sensation, false smelling discharge and intermittent oozing from the wound. So uh, there was a fungating mass diagnosed as sebaceous gland carcinoma earlier which was not treated. It's very important to go for an imaging to look for the extent of the myasis, okay? Because it can, you cannot see the disease from outside. It can go and invade into the sinuses. It may go intracranially also. So thankfully here, the disease was limited to the anterior orbit. 
but in this case uh, a lady with ulcerative necrosis because of the basal cell carcinoma and she was having this extensive myosis of the orbit with, you can see the medial wall of the orbit is destroyed the maxillary uh, wall is this thing is destroyed and the infection is going into the ethmoid and maxillary sinuses so it can be a fatal disease if it goes into the brain so management there are two steps one thing just remove the maggots control the infection and later on the definitive surgical management if for example if there is a limited orbital involvement you do a lid reconstructive surgery if there is a globe invasion you do enucleation. If there is extensive destruction of the orbital tissues, you do an exenteration. Okay. So now there are a few important things that you, because you very uh, frequently come across these cases in, you know, medical colleges, the maggots. So how will you remove the maggots? So these larvae, they have this negative phototaxis. If you put the light, they will just go inside. Okay. You won't be able to catch them. So uh, you should not use any tooth forcep to, you know, hold them because they have this hook-like structure and they, you know, uh, they clamp onto the tissues and they will break down. They, it will lead to incomplete extraction. So it's always advocated to put some suffocating agent like turpentine oil. So turpentine oil soaked gauzes are put into the orbit and it will lead to suffocation. It will, you know, it will uh, block the pores of the larva so that they come superficially to for the air for the oxygen okay also in similar way the liquid paraffin and petroleum jelly they act or you can put some anesthetic agents that will paralyze the lava okay so uh, after putting this turpentine oil soaked gazing then you can with the use of some appellation forceps or non-tooth forceps you can just plug put them you can just remove them now the treatment protocol uh, the ivermectin is the drug of choice and in severe cases you can use the triple therapy ivermectin with albendazole with clindamycin for five days and along with that do turpentine oil dressing and morphine is also given <clears throat> as per the pain score now the learning points are it's a rapidly developing highly destructive ocular parasitosis predisposing factors are skin cancer around the eye untreated eye trauma and timely removal followed by definitive surgery it can prevent the fatal complications so thank you very much i don't know if i've exceeded the time all right so Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an extensive uh, coverage of such an important topic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few questions for tonight from the social media portals. With your permission, can we please go ahead with that, ma'am? Uh, I think you are on uh, mute right now, ma'am. Am I? Yeah, yeah. now I'm able to hear clearly. Ma'am, mm -hmm. um, uh, a few of them have been covered, but uh, for the uh, sake of the other postgraduates who might listen in later as well, uh, one of the uh, viewers has asked, what is the most common location for ocular cysticercosis? Yeah, ocular cysticercosis, as I told you, it comes through the choroidal circulation into the subretinal space and then it goes into the vitreous cavity. So mostly it is seen in vitreous cavity and uh, you can see the breach point from, you know, I think the retina colleagues can tell better, but yeah, it's mostly in the vitreous cavity and very less commonly in the anterior chamber. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, the next question is, is it possible to have multiple foci of cysts in the same eye and the same patient? Very rare because uh, I told you it's through the blood circulation and uh, uh, there is only a few reports where miliary cysticercosis have been reported. And uh, there has been one report when orbital cysticercosis was associated with intraocular cysticercosis. Otherwise, they happen in isolation. Ma'am, one of the viewers has requested for a repeat of the slide showing the various stages of cysticercus uh, collapse of the cyst wall, ma'am. I think you can go back and uh, see on uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, right. sure. sure. Or if you want, I can just go back and see the, show the slide. Sure. Up to you, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay, the collapse. Okay. Mm -hmm. the uh, sonographic features right yes ma'am yes here so here you can see the response to the treatment on serial ultrasound okay so here this is the first uh, picture showing the muscle is thickened 
and there is this uh, cyst with the well formed scolex inside and when you start the treatment this is the picture after 2 weeks so here the scolex is not visible you can see the cyst is still well formed the muscle is still thickened but the scolex has disappeared after 2 weeks of initiation of the cysticidal treatment now this is 4 weeks follow up so at the 4 weeks you can see the cyst has collapsed okay so at the 4 weeks of albendazole the cyst has gone now there is no role of albendazole what is remaining is the myositis part the muscle is still thickened so you have to take care of the myositis with steroids so continue steroids for 6 to 8 weeks and this is the 6 week follow up where you can see the myositis is also resolving the muscle thickness has decreased so this is the effect of steroids right thank you ma'am um in the surgical management of cystic sclerosis what are the precautions to be taken care of to prevent a recurrence see first of all you should not take that uh, message that uh, cystic sclerosis should be managed surgically okay it's mainly a medical management Manage. now uh, if there is a subconjunctival cyst for say and then you have to remove it so as i told you the wall is very thin so you have to be very careful dissecting the subconjunctival space that you don't touch it with the you know tooth at forceps this is to all otherwise you can just rupture it so that is one thing and uh, other than that you you can also take control of the inflammation preoperatively so that the surgery becomes easier the field becomes uh, dry okay that's one uh, how do we differentiate a case of myocystis sclerosis versus a non specific orbital inflammation like probably myositis yeah that's very important so uh, one thing that i mentioned that myositis won't be having this cyst part inside okay but uh, other than that the features clinically if you are saying then myositis will be little bit more painful and it will it may not be you know limited to just one muscle okay and then uh, the myositis sarcosis the pain and the inflammatory sign is, are not that severe and then definitive diagnosis is established on imaging where you see a cyst with a scolex or without scolex okay that will establish the diagnosis yes ma'am ma'am is there a role of any sclerosing agents in inactive cysts if the cyst is already inactive then there is no role of uh, sclerosant okay the the role of sclerosant comes when you want to you know collapse the cyst or you know make it sclerosed if it's already inactive or collapsed then uh, there is no role ma'am preferred imaging uh, in cases of cystic sclerosis uh, ultrasound b scan versus ct or versus an mri see b scan is the uh, most non invasive and easy thing to do and that is very diagnostic so i i will say b scan and uh, uh, ct scan of course has a side effect of radiation exposure so in my opinion it's b scan no but in if, if like no. it's the deep uh, myocystis sclerosis and you are not able to locate the cyst sometimes then you can go for ct scan i have a, a question uh, related to this ma'am ma'am in cases of myocystis sclerosis is there a preferential involvement of uh, extraocular muscles like if we are to look like lateral rectus muscle is the only muscle with a single ciliary artery while the other three muscles are supplied by uh, dual uh, ciliary circulation so yes, is there see. a preferential involvement see uh, there are not so many you know uh, literature on these but what has been reported is that around 40% of all the muscles it is superior rectus so that was the most common muscle which is reported to be involved in myocystis sclerosis lateral rectus definitely it has got a single ciliary uh, single artery so then uh, uh, of course the involvement is not that common as that of the superior rectus yes ma'am ma uh, a question pertaining to orbital hydatid cyst a uh, image of the ct scan which you just showed in uh, one of, in the presentation how do we differentiate the clinical plus ct photograph versus a case of a pilocytic astrocytoma or a cystic degeneration in a pre existing tumor optic nerve glioma you are saying so uh, in the optic nerve cystic sclerosis yeah as i told you however it's very rare 
uh, to occur the optic nerve cystic circus but definitely you will have this scolex or hyperdensity inside this cystic lesion okay then the glioma you will see very typical fusiform appearance okay and the age of presentation then there are so many characteristic feature of optic nerve glioma that are there, okay? And uh, the thickening of the optic nerve in the glioma is, uh, you know, very characteristic, the fusiform appearance and all. So optic nerve cysty circus, you don't have that kind of thickening in the optic nerve. You just have a cyst inside the optic nerve with some inflammatory thickening of the sheath. And then the vision is decreased. It's not like glioma where you have just PL positive or no PLI. Okay, so vision is decreased like in optic neuritis, it's say 6 by 60 or so with some sort of disc edema. So that's how you differentiate it clinically and on imaging. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, in cases of uh, myocystic psychosis being treated with albendazole, uh, is there a upper limit for the use of oral albendazole? And uh, how do we taper steroids in this case? All right. So, as I told you, the uh, standard treatment is 15 milligram per kg per day in two divided doses. So, for adults, what we give usually is 400 milligram BD. Okay. There has been one report, uh, one study by Dr. Grover and Dr. Puri where they have used 30 milligram per kg per day and they have given the treatment till uh, 15 days. Okay. So, that was also effective. So, if you increase the dose, the duration of treatment was less. Uh, they have mentioned this. But then, uh, keeping in mind all the side effects and everything, the 15 milligram per kg in two divided doses for four weeks is the standard treatment that we all follow. And then we don't have, uh, you can just follow up on ultrasound. If you see the cyst or in scolex are still persisting after four weeks, you can, you can, you know, titrate your treatment. You can, uh, you know, increase the duration of cysticidal therapy for say again, two weeks and repeat the ultrasound. And then if the cyst has collapsed, then, then you can stop the cysticidal treatment then. Okay. And the steroids you mentioned, how to taper them. Right. So, uh, uh, like I mentioned, for four weeks, you give it one milligram per kg per day. Okay. And after that, you just taper it uh, as you do per weekly, you reduce 10 milligram and there, thereafter you reduce it over a period of four to six weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, one of the questions is, in cases of myocystic psychosis or uh, orbital cyst, where we are suspecting cystic psychosis, how often do we do a systemic screening exam for such patients? Yeah, uh, so usually when you order an imaging, uh, along with the orbit, you get a scan of the brain also. Okay, and I, as I told you, it's not very common to have, uh, you know, uh, disseminated kind of picture. If you see multiple cysts in the myocystic circus, then of course you will, uh, it can be a part of miliary neurocystic circus with myocystic circosis. Okay. So, usually it's not a standard of care to, you know, uh, order uh, this thing, a detail, you know, a screening of the whole body to rule out cystic circosis in orbital cystic circus. Ma'am, uh, in cases of uh, an individual, uh, like a, a pregnancy, uh, do we prescribe albendazole with steroids uh, in a case of uh, myocystic circosis? Yeah, that's uh, that's you have that we have to uh, you know discuss with our physician because you cannot uh, skip steroids for when mm -hmm. you are prescribing albendazole. Okay. So uh, you know you can decrease the doses of steroid and you can just monitor uh, it along with the treating physician, but you have to give steroids. Yeah, under supervision. Mm -hmm. um, one of the viewers has actually asked, "What is the management protocol for onchocerciasis?" Onchocerciasis is not that common in our part of the globe. And uh, yeah, it's basically you see that uh, filaria uh, in the anterior part of the eye. And uh, it's basically it's removed usually. It's surgical removal is the treatment. Okay. Similar to, you know, you, you don't want to uh, cause the death of the larva inside the eye. So you just want to remove it surgically. Ma'am, uh, in cases of orbital hydratic cyst or when we have planned a complete cyst excision, in case there is a intraoperative rupture of the cyst, what is the immediate management protocol on table? 
Yes. So uh, one thing is that you have to wash the operative field so thoroughly with the, you know, some uh, hypertonic saline. Okay. So that is a scolicidal agent. So mm. that will uh, one rescue and then uh, adjunct treatment with uh, some cysticidal therapy in form of albendazole you have to add for at least I think four to six weeks. <clears throat> And uh, in case there is anaphylaxis and all that, that has to be given a... Uh, yes. So anaphylaxis usually happens in when there is a very large hydrated cyst that is in vicinity of some very important viscera. Okay. Then only spontaneous rupture uh, can cause anaphylaxis. So in orbit, uh, the anaphylaxis had not yet been reported any. Um, uh, thank you so very much. These are all the questions we had for tonight for you. And uh, thank you for taking out time out of your busy schedule and uh, enlightening totally us. Totally my pleasure. And, uh, <laughs> and so great to be here on this platform again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Before we conclude for tonight, I have a small announcement to make. We meet next on the 5th of January, which is Friday, 8 to 9. So the lecture being orbital fractures, the mechanism, clinical features, imaging, indications, and timing, and management, surgical approaches, complications by Dr. Preeti Uday. See you all there. Okay, good night.